Hit the subscribe button if you want to learn more about everything ALS and get new notifications for all our content. Terry Waltz, thank you so much for joining us here. Um, you know, um, when I was a caregiver, um, when my husband was going through ALS when we lost last year, I read so much about you and we followed your you know, story and um, it's like a full circle having you here, um, come here and be part of everything ALS. So when we started this uh, um, everything ALS um, earlier this year with, you know, bunch of us who have always had, we all had the same journey of losing our loved ones to ALS. We said, this has to stop. And we're going to bring everything that we wish we knew, you know, when we started this journey to people uh, going through it. So you are our special guest because you don't come from ALS, but we learned so much about neurological uh, health from your journey. So I would like to also introduce uh, McFinn uh, here. McFinn, just like yourself, he actually reversed ALS. So he is our, you know, he's part of everything ALS. We call him our spiritual guide as he is to a lot of the people here. So I will um, let McFinn uh, open up this session today. Great. Welcome everybody. And welcome especially to Dr. Walls. Dr. Walls is associate clinical professor at the University of, of Iowa. She's the author of the Walls Protocol and the Walls Protocol of Cooking for Life. Dr. Walls reversed her MS, which was similar to ALS in that it attacks the nerves and the muscles. Nutrition was the key to her healing. So please tonight, open yourselves up to healing through nutrition. Welcome, Dr. Walls. Thank you so much for having me. I will share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about dietary approaches to treating MS and other autoimmunity. And I will hide things. Um, so I have grant funding from the MS Society. I've trademarked the Wallace Diet Plans, the Wallace Protocol. I receive royalty payments for those books. I've been paid to speak. I have equity interest in those companies. And I own the website, uh, terrywalls.com. Um, so we're going to cover my story. I uh, will talk about my research, uh, the recommendations. Uh, and I'll give you a link so you can uh, download the Walls Diet handout. So I have, uh, before I became a physician, I uh, was a martial artist and competed nationally in full contact Taekwondo. Um, I then went off, became a physician, had a couple of kids, uh, and thought life was great. But then in 2000, I became a patient. I had left leg weakness, uh, and then I realized that yes, I had a prior history of visual dimming. And actually uh, 20 years earlier during medical school, I started having episodes of uh, electrical face pain, trigeminal neuralgia, which had been getting progressively more troublesome. And I'd seen many physicians, neurologists and pain centers trying to manage that. Uh, but now I, I had a big workup. There were lesions in my spinal cord, one in my brain, and I had abnormal spinal fluid consistent with uh, multiple sclerosis. And so I was diagnosed with relapse remitting MS. Um, I went to the best center because I understand that MS is a progressive disease. And you know, I'm a professor of medicine, and I want to treat my disease very aggressively. So I took uh, the newest drugs, saw the best people in the country, and declined anyway. Now in 2000, the treatments were Avonex, Betaseron, Copaxone, Rebif. Uh, most people would convert to secondary or um, progressive multiple sclerosis, which is relatively resistant to therapy. At that point, they'd take uh, chemotherapy. Uh, and then if you had primary progressive MS, there was no treatment available. In 2002, I was introduced to the work of uh, uh, Lauren Cardane uh, and uh, the charity called Direct MS. So after 20 years of being a vegetarian, I adopted the paleo diet. I gave up all grains, all legumes, all dairy. So this was a huge change. The following year, I needed a tilt recline wheelchair anyway. 
and my torso muscles were getting uh, more weak. It was difficult to sit up and I was having more problems with fatigue. I, and I had been part of the North American Research Committee Quality of Life Survey every six months. And I uh, started doing that survey since 2003. Every time my MS symptoms were worse overall and my fatigue was getting uh, worse overall. By 2007, I could not sit up anymore. I had a tilt recline chair, uh, one at home, uh, one uh, in my office at work. Um, I was beginning to have problems with brain fog. I, my trigeminal neurology was much more severe, much more difficult to turn off. And so it was, it was clear to me that I would probably soon have to take a medical disability. Uh, fortunately for me, I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. I took the course on neuroprotection, a functional medicine approach for common and uncommon neurologic syndromes. And uh, again, my timeline of my illness in 1980, I started with those face pains. In 87, had an episode of dim vision. In 2000, I uh, was diagnosed. I started on Copaxone. In 2002, I adopted the paleo diet after having been a vegetarian 20 years. I converted to progressive form of MS. I started in Novantron and as in the tilt recline wheelchair. In 2004, I added various vitamins and it started on Tizabri, uh, which is the new biologic drug, which was, uh, did not help. Mm. And in 2005, I was started on Celsept and the, and the uh, Tizabri discontinued. And by 2007, I cannot sit up. I can walk very short distances using two walking sticks. Uh, and I'm beginning to have brain fog. My pain is much more severe. I discover electrical stimulation of muscles and the Institute for Functional Medicine. And I reorganize and structure my paleo diet based on the basic science that I've learned uh, with IFM. So again, this is where I'm at in 2007. I have a tilt recline wheelchair. I have a special zero gravity chair uh, that I'm in when I'm staffing residents and at home. And one year later, I'm walking around again I'm on my bike for the first time in six years. And in fact, I'm able to do an 18.5 mile bike ride with my family. So this radically changes the way I practice medicine. It will change uh, the type of research that I do. Uh, three years into my recovery, my uh, internal medicine uh, chief at the university gives me the job of doing a safety and feasibility trial uh, and and that's where uh, we wrote out the protocol that I used for my recovery. Uh, and we enrolled 20 other patients with secondary and primary progressive MS. And then we essentially did my protocol on them. And we're looking to see, could they tolerate it? Was it safe? And could they actually implement the things that I did? So the study diet was the same diet that I had. We completely excluded gluten, dairy and eggs, because those are common unrecognized food sensitivities. And I now know for me, if I have any of those foods, that will trigger my uh, brain to become inflamed and my trigeminal neuralgia will turn on. I gave a very structured set of vegetables, lots of greens, sulfur rich vegetables, color. I had a couple tablespoons of either flax or hemp oil every day, and at least four ounces of animal protein preferably six to 12 ounces a day. We had people stop all processed foods, gluten, dairy, and eggs. Uh, so all flour containing uh, products, greens, color, sulfur vegetables, cabbage, onion, family vegetables. Uh, sulfur, that's the cabbage, onion, mushroom, uh, because it improves detox. It improves uh, neurotransmitter. Uh, it improves blood vessel health. Um, mushrooms because that improves nerve growth factors and helps rebalance the uh, natural killer cell, the immune cell uh, activity. And greens because that helps you make uh, vitamin K2, which turns out to be very important for brain stem cells and for the production of myelin and for the production of calcium, getting calcium into the teeth and bones. Great source of carotenoids and magnesium and deeply pigmented, uh, particular blue, purple, black, uh, because there are many studies associating that with improved cognitive performance in neuroprotection. 
also lower risk of cancers, obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Beta carotene uh, is not the same thing as retinol, which is vitamin A. A lot of variability in how we convert beta carotene. Uh, and beta, uh, retinol is really important for immune cell function. So for that reason, I encourage people to have liver once a week. And if they could afford that, have uh, grass-fed meat and wild fish. We also encourage fermented food like sauerkraut and kimchi, seaweed, nutritional yeast, and algae to uh, boost with detox. We gave them methyl B12, methylfolate, vitamin D to get the vitamin D in the top half of the reference range, uh, and fish oil. Uh, and our study interventions, again, all those vegetables, liver once a week, if they could afford it, grass-fed meat, wild fish, we taught them a mantra-based meditation, uh, stretching uh, and uh, exercises to strengthen their walking muscles. And we taught them how to do electrical stimulation muscles uh, while they did their exercise. I had to do a pre-study before we did the actual study to show that the diet was safe uh, and that was not going to cause nutritional deficiencies. Uh, and so we're comparing my diet to the average American diet, you know, what you see is it's uh, nutritionally far more dense uh, than the average American diet. So we we're given permission to do the study. We, as I said, we enrolled 20 folks. It was a single arm study. Uh, they were secondary and primary progressive MS. We had blinded assessors and we followed them for 12 months. We reduced their fatigue severity, reduced their anxiety and depression, we improved quality of life by 16 points and five points is clinically meaningful. So that's actually a dramatic uh, and very large improvement. And we improved verbal and nonverbal reasoning and we improved their blood lipids. Uh, and this is just uh, that same information graphically displayed. The top two lines are improvement in quality of life and the bottom line is a reduction in fatigue severity. And uh, this is the association between eating the right foods and avoiding the wrong foods. Uh, so if you did that, that was strongly associated with a better uh, mood score, better uh, anxiety score, better depression score, better verbal reasoning and nonverbal reasoning and lower fatigue. Uh, and you were more likely to succeed if you had less disability, a shorter disease duration, you did more of the intervention. So if the family did the diet with you, it was much easier. And if you did the exercise, uh, you would have greater improvement with gait. Uh, we did, we've done uh, three other small studies, uh, which all of which have been uh, positive. We did our fourth study funded by the MS Society. And uh, we just completed that study. We've analyzed the data. We are drafting our manuscripts. And we'll probably have that off the publication submitted uh, to journals uh, sometime in December. I want to talk a little bit about another um, measure called the Dietary Inflammation Index. Um, and this is a way of scoring people's diets uh, based on if they've completed a dietary food frequency questionnaire uh, about the frequency that they've eaten a, a wide variety of foodstuffs in the prior year. Uh, and so when they constructed this index, they looked at uh, 6,000 articles uh, that were eligible uh, and they wanted to know, did it improve um, or increase, decrease, or had no effect on six key inflammatory uh, biomarkers? These are interleukins associated with either worsening inflammation or lowering inflammation. Uh, and uh, what they ended up using uh, was uh, 2,000 articles. Again, 6,500 articles screened. Uh, about 2,000 articles were used to create the index. And it's been used in over 200 observational studies. Uh, and uh, a negative minus 8.87 is the most anti-inflammatory diets. And many diets have these uh, types of properties, the Mediterranean, the mind, and the paleo diet being the three most common. 
And the most inflammatory diet has a score of plus 7.98. And those diets are high in added sugars, processed foods, foods containing uh, floured products. So pastas, breads, and whipped white potatoes. So these are really the westernized diet, the standard American diet. And sadly, many of the tube feeds have a tremendous amount of added sugar for the carbohydrate. Uh, and again, there are over 200 different papers that have analyzed the dietary inflammation index score uh, and correlate that with the risk of obesity, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, diabetes, heart disease, respiratory health in terms of uh, uh, asthma, uh, chronic lung disease, musculoskeletal health, including osteoporosis, maternal health, intergenerational health, uh, that is maternal uh, child health, neurodevelopmental health, uh, cancers, and also add in autoimmunity as well. It does not provide a specific definition of what food groups are part of the optimal anti-inflammation diet. They have uh, re, uh, re analyzed this data and take it down from the original 200 food parameters now down to 45. And I'm going to walk you through that. So they measure total calories, uh, protein, carbohydrate, and fat. And then the key minerals, iron, magnesium, selenium, and zinc. And then the key vitamins, vitamin A, B1, uh, so thiamine, B2, riboflavin, B3, niacin, B6, pyridoxine, B9, folate, B12, cobalamin, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E. And then those fats, cholesterol fat, trans fat, which is an anti-nutrient, you don't want that, saturated fat, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, and then the omega-3 and the omega-6 fats. And then in the red category are all these uh, uh, polyphenols, uh, antioxidants. In the middle category are basically spices. And garlic and onions could consider uh, those a sulfur-rich vegetable. And then on the right, alcohol, um, caffeine, and green and black tea were consumed. And alcohol, it's not a lot of alcohol, but a moderate amount of alcohol, uh, one to two drinks a week, appear to be uh, okay. More than that, generally negative. So we don't have one single definition of the anti-inflammatory diet. And I think that makes sense. Humans migrated out of Africa. Uh, over 100,000 years ago. And we've traveled all across the globe into Europe, into the Middle East, and then Asia, uh, and then Australia, the uh, Pacific Islands, eventually to North America, and then South America. We, we thrive in uh, rainforests, in forests, in grasslands, in deserts, in tundra. Humans, are incredibly resilient. We can thrive with very diverse dietary patterns. So if someone tells you there's a single dietary pattern that is correct for everyone, um, that's, that's not true. There are many dietary patterns that can be helpful. There are some things that I, I did want to bring to your attention. Uh, this is really a, a wonderful article um, uh, is diet responsible for differences in COVID-19 death rates between countries. Uh, and what they saw was some foods reduce angiotensin converting enzyme activity. Uh, and that uh, they theorized that that lowers the risk of COVID and COVID is inflammation uh, run amok, uh, killing uh, people because it damages the lungs, the liver, the heart and multi-system organ failure. And so fermented cabbage, and kefirs are natural ACE inhibitors. Uh, and societies that eat a lot of sauerkraut or kimchi or kefir and yogurt have much lower rates of COVID-19 deaths. So in summary, I have a dramatic story where I've totally reversed uh, my dysfunction using diet, lifestyle, uh, and I've been drug-free uh, for 12 years in terms of disease modifying drugs. 
And we have multiple clinical trials, four trials that have been consistently positive showing my dietary plan leads to remarkable improvements in quality of life. But there is no diet study in MS or ALS, at least for MS, that has been shown to reduce the number of enhancing lesions, number of relapses, or disability status, in part because we haven't done them long enough. We're writing grants now to do longer studies that include MRIs, so I'll be able to answer that question. And there are no diet studies that have been positive for ALS. They have tried some ketogenic diet studies for ALS. They have, uh, both of them had to be stopped early because of, pre, uh, of increased uh, death rates. Um, so ketogenic diets, definitely you do not want to do that for ALS. I think at the very least, improving diet quality, quality by cutting out sugar, flour-based products, processed foods, and adding more vegetables, fermented vegetables, spices, is likely beneficial for every autoimmune problem and quite possibly ALS patients. And some patients with ALS may have unrecognized gluten, uh, casein, egg, and other food sensitivities. And so if you're able to get a food sensitivity testing, that may be helpful. Again, I want to stress ketogenic diets are absolutely not appropriate for uh, ALS. You know, the WALS diet, the Mediterranean diet, uh, really, which is the WALS uh, level one, uh, but I do it gluten-free, are really great choices. Uh, and if you're on tube feedings, you could use a Vitamix or a blend tech and uh, blend food uh, so that it's thin enough to pass through that feeding tube. So uh, you can go to terrywalls.com forward slash diet. There is a one page handout that uh, goes through the diet uh, at terrywalls.com forward slash research papers. You can again uh, uh, get, um, get access to the research papers and access to the videos that show some of the remarkable gait changes uh, that we've seen in, uh, in our people. Uh, I have Facebook page at Terry Walls where you'll see me comment on some of the latest research. Uh, I also have a Twitter account at Terry Walls. And then to give you something to keep your memory going, I changed my handle for uh, Instagram. It's Dr. Terry Walls, so D-R, Terry, T-E-R-Y, Walls. In there, uh, we have pictures about uh, what I'm eating. And you'll also often see me uh, talking briefly about my meals. Uh, and we have a YouTube channel, uh, Food as Medicine. And with that, I will stop my share so that uh, you guys could uh, ask questions. And I will uh, hopefully uh, uh, answer your questions and inspire you. Uh, keep in mind, I was so weak, I could not sit up in a regular chair. I was having, uh, you know, the electrical trigeminal neuralgia that was uh, more severe, more frequent, much more difficult to turn off. And I was certainly very, very afraid that that was going to um, uh, be permanently on for me. Thank you, so, uh, Dr. Walls, for sharing your journey and also giving us a very detailed view into, uh, you know, particular food. So there is a lot of questions uh, on the chat. And um, so I would like to introduce um, Sarah Diaz um, and Zoe Lalji, who will be uh, actually asking you questions. Oh, and, great. So they'll, um, they'll moderate the question. So they will moderate the question. And uh, Zoe Lalji is, um, um, uh, she's a freshman at UT Austin. Uh, her dad is diagnosed with ALS and she has a considerable amount of, um, she's a young lady with a considerable amount of experience on how to work with uh, uh, people with ALS. And uh, Sarah Diaz is actually a medical student and she lost her father to ALS. So I will um, let both of them take it from here. Great. Thank well, you so much, Indu. Um, hello, Dr. Walls. Um, hello. Before I get into questions, I just wanna say what an honor it is to finally meet you. Um, I, you may know my mom, Dr. Shell. Uh, you guys oh, have had yeah. a lot of yeah, conversations in the past. Um, 
And I just like to say that um, your protocol is um, was the first thing we integrated when my dad was diagnosed. Um, I remember like leafing through your book and uh, being super inspired when everything felt hopeless. So, um, and he's actually still on your diet. So um, he's okay. now he's now on a feeding tube. So we make uh, we make homemade feeds based on your dietary suggestions. So um, you're kind of a legend in our family. So it's a great it's it's a great honor to actually meet you and uh, moderate you. So um, okay, and now uh, let's jump right in to the questions. Um, so our first question that we received is, um, how do you test your gut bacteria and see what's good for your body? And then if the gut is causing inflammation, what would you recommend? So we know that um, humans have about 25 genes. Our gut bacteria provide, uh, if you have a healthy microbiome, between five and nine million genes to help us perform all the biochemical processes that we need. So it's the community of uh, the bacteria that are helpful. We don't really know which, for any given gene uh, bacteria, is that gonna be helpful or not? It is really uh, the community. Uh, and so even my microbiome scientists that are part of my research team, he and I have this conversation uh, and we don't know what are the best uh, bacteria to have. Uh, in general, what I tell my patients is look at your bowel movements. Are you able to pass bowel movements uh, very easily and comfortably? Uh, or is it too loose that's in your pants? Or are you uh, passing rocks? If you're constipated, you need more fiber, more fermented vegetables. If you are uh, too loose, you need less fiber, uh, less raw vegetables, and potentially uh, less fermented vegetables we don't have a test that uh, reliably answers that question. There may be a day when we can do a uh, metabolites uh, in the blood, in the urine, uh, and the microbiome, uh, bacterial genetics, and we'll know that question eventually, but we don't, we don't yet know that. Even the research scientists don't know the answer to that. Well, hello, Dr. Wells. It's nice to meet you too. I'm Sarah. Um, Zoe kind of said it all. So uh, I'm just going to go on with the second question. Um, in terms of pre-symptomatic gene carriers uh, or people who potentially could have ALS, is this a diet that you would recommend to start even before showing symptoms? Yes, you know, absolutely. So before we become overtly symptomatic with our autoimmune disease or our neurologic disease, there's a period of many years to decades where we have biochemical dysfunction uh, and if we were doing blood tests, we might see autoantibodies that were, are brewing. And if we address diet, if we address hidden uh, uh, leaky gut, hidden uh, food sensitivities, we could reverse all of that, get all the antibodies back to zero and prevent the uh, diagnoses from ever occurring. So uh, my advice is if you have autoimmunity in your family, this is a great diet. If you wanna live to 120 with a clear mind uh, playing chess uh, and Scrabble with your kids and soccer with your great grandchildren. This is a great diet for you. Awesome. Um, so the next question is, uh, do you know anything about glutamate rich foods causing ALS and what foods are rich in glutamate that should be avoided? Uh, I know nothing about that theory. Um, and so I'm afraid I can't uh, comment for that. Uh, I would say nutritional yeast might, uh, would be high in natural glutamate, and so that uh, potentially is a problem. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, fermented foods and, and eating yogurt. There was a question about yogurt being a dairy. So is okay. it recommended? So, um, so that paper uh, referred to yogurts uh, and kefirs. I personally recommend coconut milk and nut milk yogurts and kefirs. And so that's what I ended up using. Okay. Okay. Um, the next question is regarding um, calories and um, that many ALS must uh, manage their calories to prevent weight loss yes. and how you would recommend to keep calories elevated while maintaining your diet. So uh, because of, you know, ALS, 
we want you guys to have plenty and plenty of calories. Um, so when we were, we had written a protocol for uh, NALS study and we added protein uh, powders, a lot of uh, uh, collagen into smoothies uh, so that people could have sufficient calories. I would rather uh, people get calories uh, from uh, resistant starch uh, and to get calories from uh, protein powders, particularly collagen uh, or hydrolyzed uh, peptides. And I think smoothies would be uh, really helpful uh, because uh, you can get a lot of calories in without all of the chewing work. Because uh, I understand the higher metabolic uh, uh, that occurs with ALS. Um, in terms of flour-based products, what are your recommendations for flour alternatives? Coconut flour, almond flour, nut flours? I uh, radical, recommend these radical things known as vegetables. Okay. <laughs> Squash, yams, sweet potatoes, beets, carrots. Um, uh, flowers are all going to have a high glycemic index stuff. Uh, and if you're making things with alternative flowers, you're doing, you're making more high glycemic index foods that would give you a terrible score on that dietary inflammatory uh, index. Interesting. But if you, if, but if you ate vegetables, if you ate squash and beets and sweet potatoes, you would get a, a great score on that uh, dietary inflammatory index. And you'd get a great score from me. But if you're eating pasta and bread and potatoes, you'd get a terrible score from the dietary inflammatory index. And you'd get a terrible score from me. And the, the person's asked about whole grain pasta. I do not recommend that. But of course, all you need to make the choice that is best for you and your family. If all you can do is get rid of the sugar, that is a very positive next step. Okay, um, so the next question we received is, um, why do you recommend level one instead of level two or level three for ALS patients? Well, I, I want you to be successful. So if, if you wanna do, if you have my book and you wanna do level two, that's a great diet. And that's uh, where most of my patients end up. Um, if you wanna do the elimination version of my diet, that is fine. What I, I think can be very difficult, uh, if you go from the standard American diet to the walls elimination diet. That is a, a big, big change and people often struggle. So I'd rather you do it at a pace that you can be successful at. Uh, and, and again, I wanna be very mindful. If all you can do is, I'm just gonna stop eating the sugar and the fast food and so we eat more vegetables, that is still really good for you. Uh, you talked in your presentation about adding electrical stim in your protocol. Um, what kind of benefits can people get from that? And is it able to be self-administered? Um, so electrical stimulation uh, is a way of getting your muscles to exercise. Uh, with MS, there's uh, damage in the brain and spinal cord. So the muscles uh, don't get the uh, input to be exercised. It accelerates uh, recovery. Uh, it accelerates muscle growth for athletes. Uh, so it's very helpful. Uh, uh, you would want to work with a physical therapist occupational therapist uh, to get trained on how to do that. Uh, you do it in clinic for a couple of weeks to demonstrate you tolerate it, you, you can safely operate the device, and then you can work with them to get a home going unit. Most physical therapists will not offer this for uh, their, their private patients. Uh, where it's generally used is for, is for athletes and for stroke patients. So if you're wanting to find someone to experiment with this, you'd probably have to find a physical therapist who has an athletic practice. Uh, and they may be uh, very reluctant to use it in an ALS patient because there is zero research about that you being used in the ALS population. At least I, I'm not aware of any research. Okay, so the next question that was asked is, um, how would those who need a dysphagia diet, um, for example, eating soft foods, yeah. uh, able to do your protocol? Um, so I would just put in, uh, so I've actually had quite a few folks uh, who had either traumatic brain injury or um, have had dysphagia from the MS uh, implement the protocol and they blenderize uh, the food and you either eat it, uh, soft diet, pureed diet, 
or uh, uh, through their feeding tube. Uh, you'll need a, uh, a very potent blender, such as Vitamix or Blendtec, uh, and then sufficient liquid to blend it uh, into a, uh, a consistency that you can either swallow comfortably or uh, will pass comfortably through the feeding tube. And then you have to lavage the feeding tube uh, with clear water. Um, in terms of protein powder recommendations, there's kind of a lot out there. What is the... So um, I, uh, the only protein that I uh, would want you to use is either collagen or a, uh, a peptide, hydrolyzed peptides made from a collagen. Uh, those plant proteins uh, may be inflammatory. Uh, so I, I'm not at all keen on those, but there are some uh, collagen products uh, and that's what I would look for. Okay. So the next question we got is uh, about supplements and if you think supplements has a huge impact on disease and um, if you well, can explain sure. what happened. I'm sorry. So, the, so uh, vitamin D, uh, certainly for the autoimmune patient, uh, if your vitamin D level is low, you're going to have uh, much greater risk. Uh, and so getting your vitamin D level to the top half, the reference range. However, uh, taking vitamin D alone doesn't seem to change things much. So it has to be part of the entire program. I think you also need to have uh, vitamin K2 uh, uh, and you also need to have vitamin A and magnesium. Um, so uh, it's one of the reasons I'm, I'm very keen on liver. That will give you uh, the vitamin A. Um, uh, I'm also very keen on uh, uh, emo oil. That'll give you the vitamin uh, uh, K2. Uh, you know, and uh, if you're looking for uh, uh, those supplements, you can go to, uh, again, my website, terrywalls.com. Uh, on the shop page, I have a, links to a variety of supplements that may be useful. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're aware ALS can be, is caused a lot by sporadic exposures. Um, can you talk about any potential environmental exposures yeah. you had and how they impacted your MS? So uh, we know that concussions increase the risk for Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, M MS, and ALS. And uh, you remember the slide I showed you? I was a, a kick-ass girl in Taekwondo, uh, full contact free fighting. That means you get two points for kicking people in the head. Okay. So people do that. And, you know, I, I had several concussions and I was a rough and tumble tomboy uh, farm, farm kid. I had several concussions growing up. So that certainly increases my risk. I also had uh, a lot of toxin exposure. Uh, uh, I, I was a artist, did oil painting. Uh, I did metallurgy. So uh, I had a lot of heavy metal exposure uh, because of my art background. Then I went to medical school and I was so thrilled to be in gross anatomy. I had these notebooks filled with these beautiful drawings of the cadavers. So I probably had double or triple the formalin exposure to my uh, colleagues because they just memorized uh, the cadavers. I drew beautiful cadavers on top of that. Uh, and that's when I started having my symptoms. Uh, and so, uh, toxin exposure is certainly part of my problem. I also had antibiotics very, very early in life uh, because of recurrent uh, strep throat and tonsillitis. So that led to a microbiome alteration. Because if you get antibiotics before the age of three, that will uh, uh, lead potentially to a candida overgrowth. And so that's part of my problem. Uh, and are those factors for ALS? Certainly they are. Uh, is gluten a factor for some people with ALS? Probably. Is it for everyone? Definitely not. But it, it certainly may be a factor. And toxic exposure may be a factor. And concussions may be a factor. So what you want to do is address all of the environmental factors that you can uh, to uh, slow the disease progression as thoroughly as you can. Perfect. So um, actually, one of our viewers uh, recalls a story that you mentioned in one of your presentations um, about Mother's Day when you had ALS, when and you had MS, and they would like you to share with the audience to bring us some hope. 
Okay. So I had um, had to come to terms with having uh, my progressive MS. And one of the things that you do in that, pro in that process is get to a point where finally you can just take each day as it comes uh, uh, with no clear expectations uh, about the future. So beginning in, January, in February, as I was getting stronger. And, you know, in April, I'm walking around again. Uh, and I'm walking uh, around and I'm telling my wife, Jackie, that I'd like to try riding my bike someday soon. And, you know, her response is, well, you know, hon, you're doing really well. Maybe in the fall, if things keep going well, we could get the bike out and you, and you could try. So two weeks later, it's Mother's Day. It's, um, you know, a beautiful uh, spring day. Yeah, and I go to the garage and I said, I'm gonna ride my bike. So I, you know, my, my son's got the bike. So I, I'm uh, adjusting the seat, bringing it down. My daughter hears me, she comes in, rustles the bike from me uh, and, you know, uh, screaming for uh, the family. Everyone comes into the garage and we have this emergency meeting because, you know, my, my children, uh, are afraid. They don't want me to fall and, and lose all of my progress. Um, but um, Jack, you know, bless her. Uh, she says, okay, we uh, will try. We'll walk the bike down uh, and um, we all get in position. She tells my son, he's going to jog along on the left. My daughter will jog along on the right and she'll follow on her bike. And she waits, you know, we have to wait for the coast clear that no cars are coming. And I uh, get on my bike, and I, and I push off. It, you know, the, the bike wobbles a little bit, but I make it. I bike bike around the block. You know, my son's crying, my daughter's crying, Jackie's crying, and I'm crying. And of course, when I, when I tell that now, I, I, I still cry because that felt so miraculous. Because it was at that point that I, I realized that the current understanding of MS is, is incomplete. That I'm, who knew how much recovery might be possible? And that was May. In October, I'd be able to do that 18.5 mile bike ride with my family. And I'm really tired by the end of that. But like, oh my God, the ending of MS was, was transformed that day. That this progressive MS where I'd understood from my physicians that there is no recovery, that functions once lost are gone forever was wrong, that it is possible. It, it, and life is a series of self-correcting chemical reactions. That if we can stop the damage, if you can stop the damaging process so that the self-correcting chemistry can begin to happen, then your body can begin to rebuild you molecule by correctly made molecule. And while we don't know how much recovery is possible, and while I'm still not, in some ways, as strong as a you know, healthy 64-year-old, you know, I can do push-ups. Uh, you know, I can stand on one foot. Um, I can hop. I can jog short distances. I can do things that were clearly completely impossible in uh, 2007. And if you line up the photographs of me, yes, my hair is getting more gray. That's gonna turn white on me. But if you look at my face, when I was 52, I looked like I was in my late 60s. I don't know how you know, young or old I look now, but I think I look pretty damn good. And I'm thinking I'm, I'm euthanine now, and my kids are laughing that I'm euthanine. I'm sort of like Benjamin Button. Uh, 
Yeah. So I, I'm sure I'll start aging again soon. But the, the key is, if you can stop the damage, life is self-correcting chemistry. You can begin to repair molecule by molecule. Thank you so much for sharing that story. That was, I, I am speechless. Um, that, that was, no. just thank you. Well, let me put a, a pitch in. Uh, a, a, there was a film, a documentary made about my story, Defying All Odds, um, where uh, you hear, uh, hear me get interviewed. And you get to see the younger Terry go through all of these trials and tribulations and you get to see me on my bike again. So it, it just came out, it just premiered, it, it's very touching. All right, I will definitely have to check that out. So that was, wow. Um, this is totally on another, back to the, the diet part. So I, I apologize for the rapid change, but uh, your protocol recommends two tablespoons of omega-3s. Yeah. Um, do you believe omega-3s from plants are as powerful as those from fish? Uh, no. Uh, and biologically they're not, and here, here's the reason why. So um, we cannot make the omega-3 in the omega-6 fat. We have to eat them, absolutely. Uh, so the omega-6 are uh, uh, nuts and seeds. Omega-3s are pre predominantly from animals. Uh, the omega-3s from plants, we have to add two more carbons to. And we do that very inefficiently. So you, you have to have 20 times as many omega-3 plant source molecules as you'd need if you'd had a uh, animal source omega-3. That's because you have to uh, lengthen those. Uh, and you do it a little bit more efficiently when you're pregnant, slightly more efficiently. Um, otherwise, you can only, so when you're pregnant, you can convert at a 7% of it. Uh, when you're not pregnant or if you're a man, you convert 5%. So that's why you have to have 20 times more. But, but having said that, I am very mindful that some people are vegetarian and vegan for deeply held spiritual beliefs. And you know, uh, that person, I don't, I, uh, if that's important to you spiritually, then by all means, uh, you know, stay veg uh, vegetarian or vegan. You have to take extra B vitamins and extra omega-3 fats. And forgive me, I always cry when I, Talk that back story. Of course. Um, it was, uh, just wanted to say that it's, oh my God. It was just, I, it was, I was in tears personally because I've seen my dad kind of decline and to hear that from you, someone that's been through it, that um, functions can come back. It's, uh, it, it hit home to say the least, so. Um, the next question is actually also about omega-3s. Um, so considering that omega-3s are crucial to brain health, um, what do you think is the, ratio, the proper ratio for omega-3s to omega-6s? So yeah, four to one. So four uh, omega-6 to one, uh, one omega-3. Um. And again, on the omega-3s, one of your talks, uh, one of our viewers has watched them all and uh, asks about the um, DPA omega-3 that you talked about with the Inuit people and their diet. Yeah. Could you just touch on that and what that is and why it's important? Well, the uh, Inuits uh, have uh, probably the highest intake of uh, omega-3s. Um, uh, and they have a much more of a, a carnivore diet, a uh, very high fat diet. Uh, and then during the summer, they'll have more berries. Uh, so they are um, not carnivores year round. Uh, they have some higher rates of psoriasis, uh, interestingly enough, and a higher rate of hemorrhagic stroke um, than the general public. Uh, but, you know, of course, very, very little uh, Alzheimer's, uh, very little uh, MS. Uh, you know, I, I think having, if you're a meat eater, having grass-fed, uh, grass-finished meat, very helpful. Uh, having wild, wild fish, very helpful. If you're having fish, have uh, uh, the smaller fish, sardines, anchovies, uh, herring, uh, um, uh, salmon. Uh, I, I would not have uh, tuna or swordfish, or, or definitely not shark. 
Okay, so um, one of our viewers wanted you to comment a little bit on um, what med school actually taught you about nutrition because um, they're wondering that neurologists don't recommend they, that ALS patients change their diets and just say, eat whatever you want. Uh, it takes a long time for medical standards to change. Um, yeah, uh, it, the usual tradition is uh, we uh, understand the science through animal models, then make drugs, then eventually get into human studies. Uh, fortunately, you know, I think my TED talk creates this huge stir uh, in our, our early pilot studies uh, uh, caused the MS Society to fund our research and, and some other small pilot studies that are, are coming out. Uh, so we are slowly building, at least in the multiple sclerosis world, uh, the research that says diet matters. And so far, you know, all of the studies where we've improved the quality of the diet, we get a, a better health outcome. Now, in all of these studies, when I look at the effect size, the effect size are small, but they're clinically meaningful. We have absolutely the largest effect size by a factor of two, maybe three, in terms of uh, the, uh, the changes that, that we're showing. But I also think that we, we are the most nutrient dense, but we're the only ones who've actually measured the change in diet quality as a result of the diet. Uh, it's slowly beginning to happen. The uh, funding for the NIH, because they, uh, they always want to understand the mechanisms. Most of the studies that have been funded have looked at molecular pathways, molecule by molecule. Finally, now there's uh, a lot more interest that in nutrition uh, and in uh, doing uh, food uh, intervention studies. Doing a food intervention study is vastly more difficult and more expensive than a drug intervention. Because now when I do that study, I have to randomize people to be in the study diet, study intervention diet, or the control, you know, usual diet. And so people have to agree that they're willing to stop the foods they like, eat foods they don't like, learn how to cook, learn how to cook new recipes, uh, not eat those yummy foods, even when their friends tempt them, when their coworkers tempt them. That is really hard. Think of the last time you added a new health behavior yourself. That is a phenomenally difficult thing for people to do. So these, these kinds of studies are hard. Uh, and we have to do a lot of work and coaching and support to help people make these really big changes. It's, it's happening. And, and um, I mean, I, I'm very excited. Uh, 12 years ago, when I started doing this research, uh, 10 years ago, you know, I was, I was considered very eccentric. Uh, people criticized my research. It was too complicated, too messy. I should only be doing one molecular pathway. And now, uh, you know, we've gotten funding, uh, we've done big studies, and we're, we'll soon be submitting a paper that will turn out to be a landmark paper. So in the research world, it's happening really fast. In the patient world, it's not happening fast enough. And so that's one of the reasons why I've taken this very controversial approach. And I've gotten you know, severely criticized for, for a decade for this approach is, I write books for the public. I create courses for the public. I do lectures like this for the public. I'll tell you what I'm doing and why. At the same time that I'm doing my research, my scientific colleagues kept saying, you can't do that. So you've had two double blind you know, uh, controlled trials. And I'm like, no, I can tell the public what I'm doing and be fully transparent and say, I'm investigating this, here's the scientific theory. If you think vegetables are safe, if you think meditation is safe, if you think exercise is safe, then you can do the same things that I'm studying in my research. And it's worked out pretty well. Um. Kind of on that, um, as an internal me medicine specialist, what are your thoughts about how functional medicine can be used to improve neurodegenerative diseases? Um, you know, I think it's incredibly helpful. Um, I use those functional medicine concepts in my VA clinic. 
I couldn't do any fancy functional medicine tests. You know, I could just do very basic primary care kinds of labs and very basic um, supplements like vitamin D, B vitamins, and fish oil. And we taught people, you know, how to cook and make recipes and how to basically follow, you know, level one or level two of my, of my diet in my book. We got stunning. We had really remarkable success. Now, there are some folks I couldn't help that it would have been really handy to be able to do functional medicine testing to uh, understand the food sensitivity issue and specific uh, nutritional issues that I could have supplemented more specifically. Uh, and uh, I, I will also say in the public, when I'm talking to folks, I always tell them if you have ALS, because the time course is often so rapid, I want people to go get the functional medicine testing right away for food sensitivities for nutritional status uh, so that those could be fully addressed immediately. If you have you know, MS or autoimmune thyroiditis or lupus or RA, you've got more time and you could take the functional medicine approach very aggressively or you could do uh, sort of my VA approach where we're doing diet and lifestyle first and see how far you get with that and then do functional medicine testing. But for ALS, I, really the best would be to try and find a functional medicine doc who could do a thorough evaluation right away. Okay, so the next question we got is um, regarding your discussion about Treg cells. And if you could, if you wouldn't mind expanding a little bit on um, the relationship between Tregs and um, the, the gut microbiome and clostrid clostridia. Clostridia, yes. So the clostridia, uh, there are several hundred different species and, it would, and many of these species are quite beneficial to us. But there are some species that may make a toxin called epsilon that uh, uh, may be uh, quite neurotoxic. And one of the theories um, is that some of the microbial species uh, from the clostridia, uh, there are some fungal species that have neurotoxins that may be a, a player in why people can develop a dementing illness or a multiple sclerosis like illness or ALS. I, it's, um, so I've actually been working on a paper uh, related to that uh, uh, with um, a, a colleague of mine. We don't yet know uh, uh, which bacteria are the problems, uh, but the Clostridia uh, epsilon uh, toxin certainly may be um, uh, one of the ones that I've seen most commonly identified. Uh, and uh, what you do if, if that's the problem, uh, uh, is it fecal transplant uh, the right thing to do? Uh, high dose spore, uh, probiotics, the right thing to do. Uh, I, I, I don't know that we have uh, clear answers there. We do know that the microbiome uh, absolutely talks to our gut immune cells and it will uh, cause us to make uh, cytokines or inflammation molecules that are either uh, very inf inflammation producing or very inflammation reducing uh, and again, it depends on what you're eating. Uh, eating sugar and grain-based things like pastas and breads, you're going to have more of that inflammation producing um, 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 well, immune response. If you're eating more fermented vegetables uh, and non-starchy vegetables and raw root vegetables, then you'll have more of the calming cytokines produced. You'll have more uh, of the Tregs produced uh, and you'll likely have less inflammation uh, in the brain in the central nervous system. This next question is definitely gonna be my favorite and based off of the pillows behind you, I think it's gonna be yours. <laughs> um, someone wants to talk about fiber and poop. Yeah. What do you recommend and how do we get it? Okay, so I want you to look at your poop every day. Is the poop coming easily, comfortably? Uh, are, are you struggling, straining? Uh, ideally, you want to, I want you to have uh, two to three poops a day. If the poop's coming too quickly, so you can't control it, 
then you need less fiber. So you could increase your fermented vegetables. Um, I make my own sauerkraut. It's a fun family activity. And so you could have more sauerkraut that will help move things along. You can have more raw vegetables, raw carrots, raw beets, uh, raw rutabagas, turnips uh, in your salad. Uh, that, that will be helpful. Um, you could have uh, chia seed, uh, flax seed. Uh, you could have green banana flour. Uh, you could have inulin. Uh, larch uh, is also another uh, prebiotic. So any of those would work. I would not use the grain-based um, uh, the uh, wheat uh, 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 flour, uh, just because I, I think that's going to be uh, uh, inflammatory. So the next question is regarding um, sulfur-rich foods, and one of them that you recommended is mushrooms, and um, apparently mushrooms also tend to activate natural killer cells. Yeah. It, it, and that can really help. And, um, and we wanted to ask. Um, sorry, I think my Wi-Fi is acting up. Um, want, we wanted to ask if you could explain a little bit, um, like what these two things are in layperson language. Um, so the immune cells have uh, many different uh, types of particular uh, immune cells. The natural killer cells um, are a cell that protect from new infections. So if I was going to be exposed to the coronavirus, I've never seen that before. The natural killer cell will be very helpful in my immune response in the first couple of days. That will make all the difference uh, in terms of how well I do. Uh, and then uh, when I'm exposed to a microbes I've seen before, that natural killer cell will also help uh, me make more antibodies uh, more quickly. So it, it facilitates early response and it also facilitates the adaptive or antibody response as well. It's think of it as a priming cell. Um, for those who participated in your clinical trials, have others had any similar reversals of their MS like you have? Well, we sort of had people do uh, really very well. Um, uh, if you uh, go to terrywalls.com forward slash research papers, you can get access to the papers. And one of those papers uh, has links where you could go uh, 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 see the uh, videos of the gate changes. Now, I had dramatic reversal, uh, but I also want to caution everyone I worked with a, a physical therapist who worked with athletes. Uh, he treated me like an athlete. I, and I spent all of my waking hours for four years uh, um, accelerating my rehab. I, and I did that, I, was, I figured out how to do my rehab uh, while at work. I, and so the speed of the, re, of the recovery has to do with the size of the intervention you're willing and able to do. And, you know, so we certainly had people uh, who uh, remarkably improved uh, and were uh, jogging, uh, doing really very well. Okay. Okay, so the next question we received is um, whether or not you, you still take any um, MS drugs or if your status is maintained holistically. So I have been off disease-modifying drugs since um, March or April 2008. I am still on gabapentin, a small dose for um, uh, the trigeminal neuralgia. Every time I try to get entirely off that, my uh, uh, face pains come back. So I finally have said like, okay, I still have scar in my spinal cord. I'll probably need this forever. And so I, I continue to take that. I take baclofen uh, at night, just before I go to bed, again, small dose. And that's, otherwise I take uh, vitamins and supplements. Uh, ALS has an association with dysfunctional glia cells, astrocytes, glia, and agliodendrocytes. 
Are you aware of any particular foods important to glia? Yeah, yeah, the walls diet. Makes it easy. Okay, so the next question um, is about um, an, NR, uh, an NRF2 activator. Um, one of the MS drugs, Tessivdera, uh, is, um, is an NRF2 activator. Um, and also sulfur rich sulforaphane is from broccoli sprouts. And it's also an NRF2 activator. Um, and in addition to that, in the ALS world, one of the reversals also apparently uses a phytochemical NRF2 activator. Do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah. Um, well, you know, there's a particular diet that has been specifically designed to be an NRF2 activator. And the name of that diet is called the Walls Diet. <laughs> All right, we're only gonna do two more questions. So, cause we know uh, we wanna be respectful of your time. Um, in another one of your presentations, you talked about um, research on shrinking brains and other neurological diseases like Huntington's, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. Yep. How, if at all, do you believe these diseases may share similar pathologies? Um, the mitochondria uh, were dysfunctional in all those disease states. If you don't generate enough energy, uh, then the cells, uh, you will lose uh, myelin, you'll lose axons and you'll have premature death uh, of these neurons. Uh, and so that was my original theory. Uh, so I designed a supplement protocol, which uh, did slow my, the speed of my decline. And I could tell if I wasn't taking my supplements, I was even more fatigued. Uh, and uh, so that was very helpful. When I redesigned my diet, still following the paleo principles, but got those nutrients from the food I, I was still taking the supplements, but when I redesigned my diet, very specifically to get all that stuff from the food and the nutrient density of my diet went up, that's when this dramatic recovery happened. And um, my, uh, my postdoc, who's a PhD registered dietitian, uh, he and I were talking about this. There's just this lovely paper came out that looked at uh, vitamin C I, uh, and I think they're looking at uh, impact on fatigue. The uh, they, uh, patients either got 250 milligrams of vitamin C from kiwi or 250 milligrams from a vitamin C tablet or a control placebo tablet. And the vitamin C had you know, a nice uh, reduction in fatigue. The placebo had no reduction in fatigue, but of course the kiwi had twice the fatigue reduction than the vitamin C tablet. Uh, and of course, uh, Tyler and I, you know, to us, it makes perfect sense that in nature, it, you don't get vitamin C by itself. You get all these related cofactors in other molecules that biologically, that's how our, our system evolved over 200 million years that, you know, uh, uh, mammals have been around. That it, it's, uh, Cellular biology is incredibly complicated, many, many different molecules. And so getting your nutrition from food uh, is much more robust way to restore your health. Now, yes, target supplements may be helpful. I, I, and I completely agree with that. But food, we, we, we can't waste calories on empty calories. You wanna be having vegetables and your protein source, whether it's a vegan source or a meat source, um, uh, get it from food. Don't get the processed food. You're, you're stripping out nutrients. Okay, so this is the last question. Um, and it's about Dr. Bedlack's reversals. Um, one of the similarities he had found was that all of their, uh, all of their bodies were re -nervated, much like somebody who was recovering from polio. And they, they were wondering what foods um, you may be, you believe may be more most appropriate for renovation specifically. Well, uh, the number one thing is you have to stop the damage. You will not reinnervate until you stop the damage. So you must must stop the damage. Think about toxin exposure. Think about food sensitivities. Think about uh, dysbiosis. Those must be addressed. 
then in terms of uh, uh, re innervation you're going to have to give the brain the nerve growth factor in order to do that. So that requires uh, cognitive training or physical training or electrical training so that there'll be a stimulus to re -innervate. Then you need to have sufficient protein. Then you need to have sufficient omega-3 fats and omega-6 fats to do that work. Uh, and then uh, you would uh, probably want to have uh, uh, the uh, antioxidants, polyphenols, uh, particularly the colors. Well, on that note, uh, first we want to say thank you. This has been extremely informative. Um, I know everyone on this call is just riveted by all this information and probably going to have to rewatch this uh, recording just to be able to absorb and read your book. <laughs> uh, pick up my book, uh, get on my uh, email list because if, if it go, even if you have my book, go download the diet sheet. That way you're on my email list uh, because, you know, every month uh, we send out a, a notice that has a link to my comments about the, what, what's going on that I find interesting in the research world. Uh, and I think you'd find that incredibly helpful. Um, um, I would also put in a, a plug. If uh, periodically I do the autoimmune intervention mastery course, uh, which is an online course that goes through concepts that I used in my clinics, my clinical trials. And then we have this uh, call via Zoom uh, where I discuss uh, the module and the concepts while I research, answer questions. Uh, so uh, we, have, we have lots of people who go through that. So we have, we have lots of resources. Uh, I do see people, although I, I, I do not see people with ALS, I send them to either Ken Charlin, who's in Springfield, Missouri, uh, who does a marvelous job, or Jay Lombard, who's in New York, uh, and also think uh, the world of Jay. So uh, if your members could ideally go see Ken or Jay, that would be what I'd most recommend. Um, if you just want to you know, hear my thoughts, uh, I have that online program. Or at the very least, follow me on Instagram and see what I'm eating. That would be lots of fun. Wonderful. Well, Thank we'll definitely so send much. those resources out um, with this recording too. And, and so that people can access your website and, and get all that wonderful information and your resources. Um, we actually have sent some of our community to go see Jay specifically um, through our uh, oh, platform Caring ALS, which this segues perfectly because um, one thing that we wanted to discuss tonight is Caring ALS just briefly. Um, and I have a quick, Quick, it's not a slideshow, it's just a singular slide, but the reason being, um, we know all this information is so important. We know that all these therapies that we, we listen to on these calls is vital. But one thing we're very well aware of too is it can be expensive. Um, it can be a big financial burden. I, I know it was for my family when we were going through this with my dad and it's stressful. It's very stressful and it can really make people choose between different thoughts, even in diet choices. Can you afford specific things? So um, Caring ALS is a, a platform that we've talked about before, but we've made it easier. We're here to just help with the bills. Um, it's very simple. You come to caringals.com and we help you fundraise to get coverage for whether it's therapies that you're seeing now that you're struggling to pay for or out of pocket in expenses on insurance or medical equipment that um, you're needing, but maybe not necessarily can afford. Um, we're starting our um, second pilot study next week to um, help start raise, raise the money that our community needs. Um, it's very simple. It's very easy and we will help you, you know, get through it. Um, but we have matching grants from sponsors, donations, and then we use uh, the circle because there's lots of people out there willing to help that want to help. So um, if this is something that you may need some assistance for, please reach out to contact at caringals.com. Um, if you know someone in your little ALS community who also needs help, let us know. Um, we're, we're 
it's just a simple service. There's no, no cost to you or to those that help you to, to get your bills covered. It's, it's really just to provide a means of access and affordability for the treatments that we all hear so much about, but um, we don't ever want anyone to have to choose not to receive those treatments because they couldn't afford it. So uh, very small, very short, but um, goes directly into kind of what we're talking about. So again, I wanna say thank you to Dr. Walls. Um, this was wonderful. And uh, I know it will impact and change a lot of people's choices on the, the foods they put in their bodies and how they're you know, making decisions on, on the things that they eat. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Good night. Bye -bye. Hit the subscribe button if you want to learn more about everything ALS and get new notifications for all our content.